A quick reminder to all of our hobby students that uh, Professor Chef uh, is in fact uh, one of our board directors uh, who does uh, discuss with our committee and sign off on the awarding of our annual prizes. So uh, keep that in mind. <laughs> and um, uh, Professor Chef has um, been involved with the Semantic Web uh, from uh, uh, its inception. Uh, and uh, in my recent uh, conversation with him yesterday, um, I think we dated it back to an origin in the year 1992. And so I'm very uh, pleased to have him give a presentation today uh, where the, the major focus will be on the history of the semantic web uh, and hopefully um, address any of your questions um, about his thoughts about the future of the semantic web. So uh, with that introduction, uh, Professor Chef, uh, why don't you get started? Thank you, Carl. And I always enjoyed interacting with Bavi students. Um, uh, in the past, uh, I recall that students have had good questions. Uh, today, uh, Carl has charged me with something rather challenging. He wants me to um, kind of uh, give a very broad overview. Um, and in my case, uh, my association with semantics, um, uh, they, you know, I think is about 31 years old. And uh, my association with the web is uh, um, since 1993. Um, so web was really started in 1990. And um, I started building the first system using the uh, browser, uh, Mozilla browser, uh, the first practical browser in 1993. And we continue. Uh, so there is, uh, what I'm going to do is in a uh, rather short time, give you a um, uh, 30 years of evolution of semantics and the web and the semantic web. Um, let me start with where it all started, um, for me at least. Um, I um, was giving a uh, uh, tutorial um, in 1987, so 31 years ago. Uh, that was the first tutorial that somebody gave on the area of uh, integrating heterogeneous databases, integrating different databases. And um, uh, it was given at mostly database conferences. And uh, the I essentially thought about a practical, real-world example of um, what semantics meant to us. Uh, I was visiting um, uh, Venice for the first time. And I, uh, at that time I was in a uh, uh, limited budget, so I was looking for a cheap place to eat. And I saw a uh, pizza place uh, that um, uh, was selling pizza for 3,000 lira. It was about 1,000 lira per dollar, US dollar. So, you know, it was about $3 uh, for pizza. Well, I ordered that pizza. That was supposed to be $3,000 and I got a bill of 8,500 uh, lira. And well, uh, so 3,000 was the advertised price, which is that basic price for the pizza. But um, then there were uh, uh, service charge and couple of taxes. And that all, that all added up to uh, 8,500 lira. So now you think about the meaning or the semantics of the pizza price or the menu item on, you know, in that case. And uh, you can now reflect as to different prices without, you know, the base price, the price with service charge and the price with the full, you know, the price that you have to pay with the taxes. That gives you an idea of what at the core semantics is. Another very simple example would be that Suppose you have, um, uh, uh, suppose you talk about an employee and a worker and at, at a company. And uh, in some context, uh, both of them mean exactly the same. But the words employee and worker are very different, right? So, um, uh, how do you know they are the same, exactly the same, or there's some difference? Maybe employee uh, is only about full-time employees with the, who get benefit and worker includes employees that don't also get benefit the people on contract and so on and so forth. So there'll be all these differences. 
And um, in earlier days, in 80s, and even today, unfortunately, all these years later, people often rely on what you call a syntactic, uh, you know, approaches to um, uh, think about what something means. So I have a mention of um, worker and I have mention of employee, and I have a challenge of finding out whether these two things are the same or different. And if they are not the same, how different they are. This is where the core issue of semantics comes into picture and the semantic approach is supposed to uh, help you address uh, the nuances, the distinction between worker and employee. Right? If I take that example just a little bit uh, further, uh, employee works for a company and employee owns stock in a company. So you have two entities, uh, employee and company. But in this case, both of them are related very differently. Or the uh, relationship between employee and the company are very different in the two cases. That's the core of semantics. It so happens that overall in the computer science, uh, semantics has uh, received far less um, attention than what it is due compared to what you might call IR, information retrieval. So basically when you compare the words and uh, when you compare the letters and strings and words and a currency of words and data and corpus and big data and TF-IDF, you know, f uh, term frequency and inverse distribution of uh, term frequency, TF-IDF, all those kind of techniques that uh, also were used in early search engines has received far more attention in the computer science uh, literature and even products compared to the semantics. So I think it's really important to pay attention to semantics because then you know it helps solve the problems that uh, many of the core technologies in um, information material, machine learning and NLP don't help you solve. Alright, so uh, that was in late 80s and early 90s. Let's see what I have next. Right? Hmm? Okay, uh, this is interesting. I had already prepared a few things, but this guy is trying to access this uh, thing, and I am now on Wi-Fi, so that will not allow me to access. Okay, I will, will have to just move beyond. So what happened was then in um, uh, uh, as the web came about, and perhaps all of you know that web was. Um, uh, uh, Kind of the concept of web was defined by Tim Berners-Lee in 1989. The first uh, World Wide Web server was, uh, well, you know, they start, he started to prototype it in late 1990s. And initially, uh, the browser side of it was very weak. Uh, it was called www browser. The first usable browser that came about was in 1993. It was uh, called Mozilla browser, and there. Um, uh, you kind of uh, were able to put up this so-called today's, you know, you, you are seeing this browser window right now, right, a tab. That kind of stuff started coming. Of course, they looked very different and uh, it had very limited capability. You could not display many types of media then, yeah. But at least you had the uh, uh, hypertext links that will, uh, you know, then make, uh, you know, uh, access a server and uh, render what is on the server within the browser window. Now, um, that time, in 1993, I initiated this project. The project uh, was called Info Harness. And um, here are some of the collaborators. And what we what uh, we started doing was to say, you know, all this lot of data. In those days, um, still the web was not yet there um, in, on a large scale. It was just coming about. Um, but there was a lot of data on what is called as intranet. So companies or academic education institutions had their own uh, connection, network of their own. And, uh, you know, the documents were put on those net and uh, you could access the documents. So one of the earlier access to data came about also through access to the documents on your intranet. And um, anyway, with the um, internet, all these data were becoming accessible in a more uh, uniform way, right? So 
Earlier there were some protocols that were proprietary called there was an SNA protocol, but then came TCP/IP. Ultimately, TCP/IP became the most successful uh, one, thankfully. And then um, you know on that gave, gave us the internet infrastructure, and on that there is the web infrastructure. So we started thinking that you have different kinds of object on our network, internet or intranet, and uh, how can we start providing uniform access to those objects? Uh, from a um, uh, from a browser, right? So what we started to do, and that was pretty early. Uh, in those days, the um, most of the access was point to point. So you need to know explicitly the link uh, to uh, the web page or a document on the server to be able to access that. And in fact, uh, uh, academic institutions were really um, uh, at the forefront. So uh, we would remember the websites of uh, academic institutions that are doing research in the area of our research and you will access to what um, you know whatever document papers that they had published from their web pages from typically your colleagues web page on some other university's website but here we uh, in this project we said okay what we'll do is uh, we'll go beyond uh, the in information retrieval techniques and traditional um, string based matching that the very basic index, uh, you know, search index, search engines were giving, and we said we will develop uh, a uh, an object, metadata object that will describe any document. So you may have documents of many different kinds, and we created a structure, uh, you know, a class structure, a semantic uh, structure for describing objects of different kind through the metadata about that object. So we created an environment to be able to, we create capability to be able to extract metadata from the documents, organize that metadata in a model, and then use that model uh, from our browser window to be able to search. So we are searching not just by the uh, keywords and strings, but also by metadata that we had extracted. That also led to what we, uh, uh, probably the first um, system that provided web-based, attribute-based search, or also called faceted search on the web. So then you can say, give me a document that is authored by so-and-so. Not the document that mentions that person, but the document that is authored by that person. Give me a document of uh, uh, what document that is authored by so-and-so. I can ask this kind of queries, right? And that came about, uh, that led to this uh, info hardware system that we started developing uh, in 1993. Uh, uh, first pu publication was at the second uh, conference on World Wide Web. And in 1995, it also became commercial product from Belcore. Uh, that is a company that we started this work at. That's where I was working in those days. That was my uh, third job uh, after my PhD. And um, uh, that became commercial product. Unfortunately, it did not become a very big product because I failed to convince the um, uh, business uh, decision makers who were MBAs to say there's something called internet market. And that is a very big important market, not the compared to the telecommunication market that uh, Belcor served. And hence, they limited, they limited the sales of uh, info harness. Uh, uh, to the telecommunication market and hence it did not become a very large uh, internet based product. Anyway, the next thing uh, uh, you know uh, was that I in 1991 and 93 uh, this, uh, uh, this, there used to be a student at uh, Stanford his name is uh, Tom Gruber and he started he adopted old term called ontology, which is a very old term. It goes back to the uh, Aristotle and, uh, you know, uh, uh, earlier, uh, you know, logicians days also. Uh, knowledge representation by peers and other things. But he essentially started, uh, you know, def adapted the use of word ontology in the context of modern information systems. I uh, immediately uh, liked that idea and in fact I gave a keynote in 1992 called so far yet so near, so far schematically yet so near semantically. And in 1993, we actually worked on a project um, that uh, is not showing up here uh, because of uh, this, uh, 
But uh, let me see. Um, no, uh, no, that's not what I want. Uh, so, so in that particular work, we started to. Um, let's see if it's there. I will get. Yeah, so we started to do this class of work um, and there we use an ontology to describe the content in a database and we then created a model where we had um, uh, multiple ontologies, uh, each ontology describing the semantic <coughs> content of a database and an ontology that would um, allow a user to define his query, that led to a class of a whole series of work. One of them is described here, so if you look at uh, this Wikipedia page, there is discussion on multiple ontologies. So we did this observer system and um, that was uh, the earlier, uh, first work on multi-ontology query processing. We had earlier work than that um, in 1994 as well as there was some work by uh, uh, my friends at uh, uh, at ISI, uh, so Craig Noblock and um, Allen's, they had a system called SIMS. So the idea of defining a query using an ontology, mapping that query onto uh, another ontology that um, uh, you know describes some information resource, that class of work got done. Right. So there was a, a bunch of work in basically 1990s that dealt with. Um, uh, uh, you know, use of ontologies. There's another uh, very interesting aspect of semantics that is very important. Suppose somebody is interested in um, uh, finding a, a um, you know, a flower that is a sweet, small, uh, a white flower that grows in warm places. That is a very sweet uh, smell, right? So uh, this, like, flower called gardenia, which is, you know, which, for example, would be one of the answers to this query. Most of the work, earlier work, was that you will ask keyword query. But, you know, you want picture. And how do you know what is the smell and what is a white flower if it's described in a text, unless somebody has tagged that explicitly that image, right? And so, um, uh, uh, we defined, uh, we, we said, okay, you know, if you want to ad, uh, ask questions about objects, multimedia objects that are not only textual objects, but in, let's say, images and then video, well, you have to, uh, you have different forms of search needs. You have traditional keyword search, so you can see here, keyword search here on the thing. You have attribute based search. So, say, smell equal to sweet. Smell is an attribute of a flower and, and then there is a value to that. So here you can say color of the flower equal to something. And then you can have content based search which is the image matching search, pixel based image processing. So give me flowers like these, flowers with RGB and other concepts thereof. So there is a a thing here of compo image composition, image texture, image, you know, variety of image related features. And you can incorporate that in your query also. So I think this was the, uh, probably the earliest work on um, uh, these three forms of search, keyword search, attribute search, and uh, media specific, in this case image search, that was combined together to get the results, right? And so here, think about the importance of semantics. And by the way, when, when I'm showing you this, this is a browser window. That means we are doing this kind of search on, uh, and this is a semantic search, right? When you say attribute, attribute is a prop or a property or a facet that is defined in a model or an ontology, then you would, um, uh, start to um, uh, uh, you know 
you 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 basically be supporting a, a semantic search, right? So this is a very early example of semantic search, uh, which is uh, both faceted semantic search, or faceted search, but also which are also a model, but also it is a multimodal search. Right? There was a version of this that was called video anywhere. So there, what we started to do was we started to develop a, a software in Java for cable set top box. And uh, a broad, broadband in USA was starting to come in 19, late 1990s. Right? And so we said, uh, you know, consumers have, um, uh, they want to, you know, recall a video that they have seen. And they want to be able to search for the video in their video library. Like I, I used to take a lot of photographs, uh, sorry, videos of my uh, children, my, my girls. And, and, and also to put, out, put that in a, a storage. I want to do a search. It's very hard to search those videos. Even today, it's hard to search those videos. In addition, I want to be able to search uh, that, uh, you know, about, um, you know, a, an action thriller TV program that is starring whatever, uh, you know, some actor of your interest. Right? So I have genre, genre I have actor name, and so on and so forth. Right? I have TV program, type of uh, you know, object, uh, video object. How would you describe this? This is very hard to describe this well in a keyword search. Thus, we started to develop a semantic search for video and that software was called Video Anywhere. Now, what happened along that line, just about that time, is that, um, um, oh, uh, before I go there, let me take one more diversion. So we started working on uh, defining rather complex relationships. Uh, I, I, I'm fond of saying relationship is at the heart of semantics and the semantic web. Uh, so in that case, look at this query. Find all nuclear tests conducted by India or Pakistan after January 1, 1995 with seismic body wave magnitude of greater than 4.5 and all earthquakes that could have been caused due to this test. Think about this query. So we had a system that followed info, uh, info harness called InfoQuilt. InfoQuilt uh, assumed that there were objects of different media. Then it also assumed that there is a quilt, patch quilt of metadata extracted from all the different media objects. And it had multiple ontologies. In this case, there is an earthquake ontology and there is a uh, nuclear test ontology. And there is a, uh, we had used the word called information landscape, but information correlation that, so if you think about expressing this query and you had models or multiple ontologies, then you'll be, you can think about, imagine how you will do a multi ontology, uh, you know, a query specification and execution of that. And so there's this paper in BLDB journal that extensively discussed that kind of stuff. I want to show something very interesting. This paper, this work was started in 1998, published in 2002. You see here, that's uh, what you see in Google's Infobox idea. That you have a query, you have query results, and you have media objects and metadata about that objects that you're showing. So we are talking about now, you know, Google started supporting this in 2013, right? This is uh, way long, you know, 15 years ahead of that time frame or, or, or something like that. Uh, there is a lot more to that. I am going to pass now in the interest of time. So uh, now, so I just talked about this first bullet that you can see here, right? And um, uh, um, one other thing that started coming is uh, um, representational uh, form for uh, you know modeling ontology. So we had um, uh, you know I mentioned here our system info harness and sim and Ariadne and then our system observer. Then the shoe was there. I think it was about 1996 or so. That is a system that the handlers group did. Okay, and uh, then handler went to um, uh, DARPA and he got a big pot of money and he supported development of this language called DAML. DARPA Asian markup language. So these were now interesting thing to do is these are Asian people, people AI people working on multi-agent systems. 
And uh, in Europe, there was a counterpart called OIL, which was also a logic-based language. This is, this is work done by mostly description logic people. And they developed this. They used to come together, and that became OWL, query language within W3C. Okay? But a lot of, uh, you know, remember the logic and description logic um, bias that, uh, you know, that, that went into this. Team is credited by, uh, you know, is putting, uh, of putting the two terms together. Obviously, he's the father of the web. But he also is credited of putting together these two of semantics and the web. Now, I can, you know, remember the 1994 paper that I talked about that I, we had, I had my, my first PhD student, Vipul Kashyap, which had ontology, which had data, which had browser interface, which had metadata, all of this was there, right? Info harness are also are there. We use the word, unfortunately, we use the word semantic information brokering. So there are different objects of different kind, and and what happened was it also partly is political in the sense that it was unclear that for us, if we had used that term, that will have in those days when we published 1994 paper, a lot of med, uh, uh, academic uh, researchers, my colleagues, were very skeptical about web. Unfortunately, <laughs> some people are very, you know, they're, they're lagging, you know, they just don't know, know the importance. So, kind of I was forced, I had, a, I had a paragraph that talked about doing all these things on the web and had an implementation, had a product even. The Furnace product was a web-based product. But um, we use the word information brokering as a general term rather than semantic information brokering rather than, and we have a book, we, we and I have a book on semantic information brokering. And his thesis was on semantic information programming. So anyway, uh, and, but uh, Tim used this word and that stuck. And that became very popular, so that it's, uh, you know, you know, all of you know about semantic web. I happened to, in the same year that he had the book, I happened to start the company called Tali. And uh, I think as far as I know, this was the first commercial company that was semantic web company. Remember, we already had Info harness, video harness, info observer, and and video harness. All of them that had ontology, that had semantic representation, that had web interface of different kinds. All of that were there. So I said, look, there is a growth of digital content on the web, and I know of semantics as a good way of getting to that information. So uh, let us bring uh, broadband and digital media together and provide the search. And that is called Tali. Tali in Indian uh, language of Hindi is applause, like that. That is Tali, right? And um, it so happened that then we, um, uh, I don't like this. Okay. It so happened then that we uh, filed for in year 2000. So, you know, the company was founded in 1998. In 2000, we filed for a patent, and within one year, the things were very fast. We got a patent in 2001. Right? Now, interesting thing is, if you look at this patent, the title is Semantic System and Method for Creating a Semantic Web and its Applications in Browsing, Searching, Profiling, Personalization, and Advertising. This patent was filed uh, well before uh, uh, the uh, uh, May of 2001 article on semantic web by uh, Tim Berners-Lee and Handler and uh, uh, another thing. So uh, whatever you see here, obviously we have not seen that, but in fact it was filed uh, and probably filed before that article probably was submitted and certainly before it was uh, published. So here what you see if you look at um, uh, this article is that this had knowledge graph. The word we had used for knowledge graph was, um, uh, and or, or ontology, and the word we had used, uh, common, we had, uh, I had kind of two sides of a coin. I had a research group going on at uh, University of Georgia, and I had the company. In the research group, I will use the word ontology. In the company, I would use the word world model because um, AI winter had happened, and people did not like AI yet. In '99, people were not hot on AI. In fact, if you talk about AI, the commercial customers will shy away. Okay, they will run away. Hence, I use what world model. But in 
you, you see these graphics, in principle, this is entities and relationships, and that's basically knowledge graph. It was not a proper ontology, it, uh, as in, it, in fact, it, interestingly, it was in fact not an ontology of the form that um, the uh, traditionalist, uh, the Damal and our people advocated, purposefully so. Exactly for the same reason that Google decided not to use ontology, um, uh, not to use description logic, not to use, um, uh, you know, and, and they have chosen to keep a knowledge graph, right? Entities and relationship. Uh, sort of like RDF, but not RDF instead. In fact, Google does not use RDF. My company also had very much like RDF people, so, but not RDF itself. Okay, the verification of the things, we didn't want to go for that. So, um, um, uh, in that, here, uh, it, it, this is an interesting thing. This is exactly, you see the, the, the diagram that comes from the um, patent. And you see on the you know, right hand side, there is this, um, um, uh, a, what you might call a, a knowledge graph or an ontology. You can see that there are uh, news, entertainment, travel, and then sports domain. Within the sport domains, you can see there are all, you know, uh, subdomains. Within the football, if I further drill down between professional football and amateur football, college football, that kind of stuff, right? So we have developed all these domains. Not only had we developed the domain, but we have developed a comprehensive infrastructure for automatically creating and maintaining this knowledge or knowledge graph from multiple knowledge sources. Now contrast this with something that I uh, was told by a former employee of Google who worked in Google's Knowledge Graph group. He said there were about 1000 people working in Google Knowledge Graph. I had one and a half persons working on my Knowledge Graph. Now my Knowledge Graph here at those days was not as big as Google's Knowledge Graph. So there is an apparent knowledge. But we had an extensive amount of uh, plumbing necessary, tooling necessary to, uh, you know, take knowledge from multiple sources and I'll, I'll give an example, knowledge of that you would, for example, take from, would be let's say from allmusic.com, which is equivalent to today's music brains, if you know. And then we will further curate it and map it to our music ontology or, 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 or schema. Plus, we had ability to see what difference has happened, changes happened in that source from the last time I accessed it. So we had knowledge agent. They'll go to the sources, access the knowledge, decide do we already have that knowledge or this is a new knowledge? Is the new knowledge uh, uh, conflicting with the knowledge we already have? So we had the knowledge saying Hillary Clinton is the first lady of the United States. Then election happened in uh, 1999, November. Starting uh, 20th of uh, January 2000, Mrs. Bush became first lady. The agent found now new thing, Mrs. Bush is the first lady. I have that knowledge in the knowledge base saying uh, Hillary Clinton is the first lady. Well, we had ability to add the new knowledge to that record when the knowledge, new knowledge was found, all that kind of stuff. And utilize it in our query processing system or reasoning you might call it. One of the very powerful things that you did in those days is this diagram here. So this is, uh, think about a, a document of any kind or a web page if you want. And we use that knowledge graph or uh, world model or ontology to annotate all of these, uh, you know, entities and relationship and extract relationship. And notice this, that the things we did was rather complex. The standards and poor file index, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 gram. That's very hard to get. You may remember Pramod, one of you know, the students who are here in the audience here, they may remember Pramod's work on using um, uh, uh, C CRF in congestion with our ontology knowledge graph for travel. Or oh, sorry, for whatever it, we had used to uh, extract this kind of thing. So we not only extracted um, you know entities and relationships, but also did this complex entity extraction relatively. And this involved use of the reason we could do is because we had uh, machine learning technique. So if you look at this um, 
the paper, this was published in 2002. You can see we are using Bayes classifier, Bayesian classifier, and HMM. Right? HMM is a precursor to CRF. Right? And we use a knowledge based classifier. But basically, knowledge based classifier is simply looking for term matches in the ontology or knowledge graph we had. And we had a, a combine, you know, ability to combine. So there is boosting method available when you use multiple classifiers. Mm -hmm. And we were able to process 1 million documents per hour per server in, in that time frame. That's quite an achievement. Right? And you can see this relationship competes with that is defined in the ontology and then we are able to find. So this was very exciting work that we did, but this of course supported facial search, semantic search, and we I think the the first semantic search engine, Dali had, it was called MediaAnywhere.com. Okay, and it will allow you to search video and audio on the web. I guess you can also search for text on the web. All right, um, and um, uh, okay. So um, let's see. That's about. Um, uh, this now in year uh, remember this is the um, 1999 when the term was found and in the term was still not popular 1999 uh, in 2000 uh, in 2001 when they used that in that scientific uh, American then only most people notice it before that it was chapter 11 or 13 of Tim Berners Lee's book in a web page and a team defined a uh, semantic web in the context of metadata primarily saying it's all about associating metadata with the web page. That was all that is his view of the semantic web, which was consistent with uh, our view. Uh, all history, all of history, starting 1993, uh, we were extracting metadata from the uh, you know documents of various kind, including web pages. Now, um, but then in the 2001, they went all the way to the agent stuff. So if you look at that article is all about use of ontologies and agents and you know the example they used was that of automatically doing um, somebody's um, uh, um, uh, travel uh, you know so example was you know travel agent software agent doing uh, travel reservations for somebody interesting thing is using logic based formalism first of all logic Team Palestrini was going to be visiting a. Um, uh, we were going to be visiting a Dieter Fansel's group, um, and uh, so Dieter Fansel's group decided to try and implement this travel agent. And now we are talking about many years after 2001. Okay, so this was I think probably 2007 or so, or eight, or, or maybe even later. It took them seven pages just to write specification of some of the requirements that would define what team Bernersley, you know, what team style. Think about it. Who has time to write seven pages of description logic or first order logic to, uh, in the hope that the agent will understand that and then make, uh, you know, the choices, the right choices for the reservation. Now you see the fa why that that whole uh, thing failed. Thankfully for us, the process that was the general idea that was outlined in the uh, effort that Tali and Symagix uh, took, that succeeded. So let me uh, show you um, a couple of things. So um, where is my PowerPoint? So this is the uh, first a uh, keynote that was given in uh, anywhere on semantic web uh, because the very first um, uh, remember the term appeared in 2000 right so in uh, sorry 1999 it was not yet even popular in 2000 there was a um, uh, 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 workshop at, in Lisbon Portugal on semantic web since I already had a company I gave uh, this and I was asked to give a keynote um, uh, and my keynote was titled Semantic Web and Information Brokering. And I was only talking about commercialization that we had done. 
right? The information brokering is because that is the word that we had used. Semantic web is because I knew this word is going to be very popular, right? That is how that article was chosen. I knew I had to combine, go from semantic information broker to semantic web. And if you look at this, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, a keynote, um, then it talks about this. Some of the things that I'm talking about. It of course talks about RDF. Uh, we had started to work, you know, we had implemented a system in RDF in 1998, the same year it became a standard. Uh, uh, but um, uh, let me see, um, uh, you know, I, then I, I basically discuss here how, why uh, Yahoo, its directory system is going to be failing, and is failing, and why uh, search, and then eventually semantic search will replace uh, the uh, thing. So this talks about Yahoo. You can see Tali, world model, domain model, and then I use the word ontologies. You can see all those things are there, right? And, um, uh, you know, uh, the, here is a very interesting uh, thing I want you to see. So you're doing a search about a video uh, about a football. The interesting thing is you're searching for a touchdown, a video on the touchdown that involves uh, this guy uh, Ismail or, or, or Tony Banks. Interesting thing is that the video description itself on the web page does not even have those names. Right? That is the power of semantic search. So what happened? When we, when our extractor went to the web page and looked at this asset, this you know, pay, uh, you know, this particular uh, content, we figured out that that is Steelers. And it mentions the quarterback. In our knowledge base, or knowledge graph, or ontology, has knowledge of who is the quarterback for Steelers. And then we say, player, this is called semantic enhancement. The paper I was showing you about that annotation, that paper is all about the, the you know, semantic search engine. That is all about semantic enhancement and then using that enhancement to search. So now we are doing, we might call a form of implicit search, right? The, the term, no keyword search can succeed, right? Keyword search, well, nobody used the term Tony Banks in this text, so obviously you're not going to find it. But it is about Tony Banks, you know, you know touch, bank, uh, touch bank of Tony Banks, right? Or in, you know, involving, uh, in, involving Tony Banks. Not only that, you can see here this thing in the yellow, this is our info box with all this metadata. Right? Uh, Google is today giving you a lot of data from um, uh, Wikipedia. Actually, they started with giving a lot of metadata from Wikipedia. Now they are increasing to give you more metadata from the knowledge graph. We are giving this all this metadata from our knowledge graph or, or on top. Right? So you can see, and this is this advertisement and many other things like that. So this is facial search. So you can see here, you're doing music search and artist is Moderna. And here you can see that um, uh, you know all the uh, matches with Madonna as an artist. But then, after exhausting all the results where Madonna is the artist, we'll also show you the results where Madonna is the uh, you know is the is the um, uh, actor, not musician but actor in different role. So it is semantically less related. Where the content is about. A Moderna as an artist country is mostly that's what user is asking for. Now, of course, here we use facial search, but you can also develop NLP search interface where it will understand. You say, give me uh, content about, uh, 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 you know, a content where Moderna is an artist. Then you understand Moderna is a particular artist name, artist is the type, and then you can create the same query internal representation as that this form is representing, right? And then you can get the results, and then you can got, get this, uh, what we call as a, uh, we call it rich media reference, which Google calls Infobox. In fact, a rich media reference, if you look at, is even richer than Google's uh, Infobox. We were doing already advertisement here, merchandising. You see here, in the bottom, I can tell you directly to the Moderna specials, in the DVDs and video uh, series that I can sell on Amazon in those days. So I've already cross-linked through the metadata on the specific content on Amazon website. Right? So that was semantic search. We also did browsing. This is very interesting. 
So when we do search here of David Dua, my system looks up the knowledge base and understands that David Dula, Duval is a, a golfer. And hence you can see here uh, the ontology for golf shows up. Talk, you know, because you see here attributes are location, tournament, course name, place. These are all related to golf. Uh, <clears throat> but if you need Robert Dua, see it is applied. It is now using movie ontology uh, part of the knowledge graph. Okay, this is the knowledge graph here. Attributes of the movie and all this is part of the knowledge graph, right? So this is semantic. We call it blended semantic querying and browsing. See here, all of the things with metadata and all that. This has value even today. This is not explored enough uh, today. So that is that uh, video. Um, now, um, I, okay. Let's go back to the uh, slides and see what we can do to. In 2001 and 2003, I gave other keynotes. So there is this keynote of semantic web in actions, ontology driven, information search, integration, and analysis. And there, um, um, I gave, by the way, this one tells you how we created the ontology maintained. Um, this is my hope, to recreate that for our chemistry project. And one day, we'll sit down in detail and discuss the toolkit that we need to develop for our chemistry project. So here it shows that given a content, we will do automatic classification, decide what kind of classic, uh, uh, you know, the, what domain is most relevant to this, and apply the knowledge subgraph that is relevant to that particular, you know, domain or subdomain classified, and then use that particular subgraph to reduce the noise. So the, now you see, uh, you know, the general thing of SARS is. Um, you know, uh, uh, PhD and how it progressed along that line. I'm talking about how do you understand there are many Athens. Athens in Greece, Europe, Athens in Georgia, Athens in Ohio. How do you understand which Athens you're talking about? So there are issues of that kind of things that we talked about and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, this is an interesting thing. This is a dashboard that we have developed. And this dashboard is very interesting because we have content that is pushed and pulled. So there's websites and there are databases. And then we are automatically giving you for a given company uh, in a name or stock symbol, the news, the analysis, the earning news, the industry and competition that use requires you to say, who is the competition of this company looking up by looking up the ontology and knowledge graph and then getting information of them uh, and, and many other things like that. And real time integration with the Stock information, stock, uh, uh, you know, sticker, uh, sticker, you know, sales information, all kind of stuff that are available there at that time. Okay, well, that's that. Now let me let's go back. Right. Sorry, I got too many things open here. Okay. And then, yeah. uh, I am going to now, so lot more information is in this uh, little thing called 15 years of semantic search ontology enabled um, semantic applications. Let's go to a couple of interesting things now. And now we are going to go to the modern era. And let me give you guys a little feel of what is happening with, uh, uh, you know, 
semantics and ontology in um, healthcare and um, big data of various kind. So to give you a sense now, um, we have a project uh, that uh, deals with um, uh, social health signals. So we can do, um, you know, when a user asks questions, uh, we can understand whether that question is about diagnosis or treatment and then give you the appropriate information plus the system would know whether the information is coming from a reliable source or not. Um, we uh, do a lot of work where we use semantics and ontology to better understand a variety of content. So let me see if I have a slide that uh, particularly explains um, that. So here, uh, this slide explains the fact that we get a lot of Internet of Things or sensor data. All that data gets annotated represent in the common format, uh, standard format, use, use the ontology on, as you can see on the right hand side here and then allows you to uh, query all of the data in taken away. This is actually what you are supposed to be making happen, right? Um, uh, these are some very interesting examples. So um, he showed shortness of breath in last visit. but. Uh, another text would be dyspnea was observed in the last visit and another example is labored breathing right? all of these things have about the same meaning so how do you know they are the same again uh, use of uh, techniques that allow you to know that these things are very related uh, heavily rely on use of knowledge graph or ontology so I don't have time to discuss all that look at this text here this is a web forum and you can see a lot of different kind of things that you can understand. You can understand entities, you can understand dosage of uh, medication you have taken, you can understand pronouns, you can understand interval like uh, you know for one week or something. You can understand relationships, for, uh, you, you know, for example you can understand how did you take that drug by injection or by snorting or what. So you can understand sentiment, you, you, are, you are happy with the uh, results or not. All those things that you can understand. Here, for example, we use ontology, we use lexicon, we use lexicontological, we use rule base, a broad variety of techniques to help you understand many, many different aspects of the language. Right? So that these are some of the modern things that we've been doing with the um, um, uh, with the ontology and such in the healthcare domain. Let me finally go to this uh, talk. Um, uh, recently I gave a keynote and the, the keynote is about um, uh, uh, knowledge will uh, uh, propel machine understanding of big data. In this one, what we demonstrated is that for variety of applications, we can pair uh, machine learning and natural language processing techniques with ontology and knowledge graph to get consistently uh, better outcomes. And the general idea is the following. Uh, we have been, uh, in my group, we've been very much uh, looking at brain-inspired computing and how can we develop next generation of computational techniques that kind of learns from brain. Our human brain is very powerful in taking so much of the data, like our human sense, uh, senses get bombarded with about 11 million bits per second of data. However, our brain converts all of that into just a few bits of second, uh, uh, you know, of information. That's amazing level of what we call as abstraction. How can we develop computational technique to support this abstraction? So we are working on semantic, cognitive, and perceptual computing techniques to, that utilize broad variety of semantic and um, uh, NLP and machine learning and deep learning techniques to support, uh, you know, those kind of processing, right? So that is another, way, you know, a, a, a area of work that we are doing, and where semantic is plays the important role. Um, one of the most exciting thing that we are working on right now is uh, in the area of chatbot. So I just gave a talk. Uh, this talk is on um, uh, human like. Uh, let's see, what do we title that? We call it human like chatbot. So this is a very challenging topic and in fact I discussed in my keynote that this is not something that is going to be achieved right away. 
In fact, the talk ex explains why it is so hard to do. But the point here is that, again, in this one, you see the um, incorporation of semantic techniques, ontologies, knowledge graph, along with conversational AI and other techniques that are popular today or emerging today, to develop something very valuable, where chatbot will talk to uh, patients to improve, to better manage the healthcare, to remind them, to figure out what's going wrong with them, to involve physicians at the right time, uh, you know, get their intervention at the right time, and things of that nature. So, if you're interested, you can look at this. This uh, talk also has a couple of um, uh, 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 demo chatbots uh, that you can look at it and see why, again, and, and reflect why semantics plays a very important role, why you need to be able to modeling. And in a way, for me, these are you know, new incarnations of the techniques that we learned from, from the semantic web techniques. So now I will wrap up, uh, more or less. Okay. So uh, I want to do, in the wrap up, I want to do just a, kind of a little bit of remark here. I'm going to go to a search engine. Uh, old, and, and this is called old wine in a new bottle. So I'm going to go to this uh, uh, bibliography search engine and let's search for semantic web. And I want you to look at this graph here. Look at this graph and look at the you know, mentions of semantic web. Clearly semantic web is not doing that well. But I'm going to change this to knowledge graph. So you can see that that's growing very fast, right? or has grown very fast. Right? So at a fundamental level, there isn't that, that much difference. Okay? But uh, people, you know, these are this facts and uh, things kept going point here I want to make in ending this talk is that uh, the semantics, um, you know, role of semantics very pervasive, very important. Uh, it is similar to thinking about uh, how our brain processes information. Our brain has two things going for it. It has um, uh, knowledge and experiences that we gain over a period of time. And it has um, the ability to reason, uh, you know, connect the things. It can connect the dots, it can um, uh, look at the pattern, it can look, you know, it can extrapolate what you have learned in the past. A variety of computational techniques, you know, we have in our brain, which utilizes knowledge. So, think about a brain with only one of the, one or the other. It's not going to be the brain, right? The same thing I want to tell, you know, basically share with you is that the ontologies, the knowledge graph, uh, are equivalent, uh, are, are, are really that important as knowledge is important and experience is important to human brain. And incorporating that in our computational technique will make us very powerful. Within the umbrella of semantic web, a lot of interesting things have been done. Creating this knowledge graph, annotating text, annotating media objects, searching, browsing, analysis, prediction, all of those are very interesting and we can employ uh, to, to develop uh, modern systems, modern applications like chatbot, and I hope uh, I helped you understand. Help you understand that. My time is coming to the end, so let me uh, um, turn over to the audience and uh, you know take questions. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Shift. I hope uh, everybody uh, has a much greater understanding and appreciation of the fact that uh, work on the semantic web uh, began much, much earlier um, than many of the current uh, investigators would have us believe. So uh, uh, as Professor Sheff has, has demonstrated throughout his uh, presentation, uh, goes all the way back to uh, perhaps even the late 80s, but certainly um, just ballparking it around 1990. So uh, let's set uh, questions uh, from students. Uh, 
Uh, certainly uh, students on the Four Doors Project team uh, on the Semantic Web. I had Thank one you. question. Yeah, I had one question. So, uh, Dr. Sheth, you had mentioned my, uh, many applications are, that were developed and released in the 1990s, such as uh, Sims, Ariadne, Shu, InfoQuilt, etc. Are any of those uh, still being used today? Or have they gone like uh, defunct? Which application are you talking about? Uh, you had mentioned a few such as uh, Sims, Ariadne, Shu, InfoQuilt. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so those were all. Uh, uh, so InfoHarness was a commercial product. Uh, Sims, Ariadne, uh, Observer, these were uh, research projects and, and prototypes. Uh, none of them are, of course, in operation today. Uh, the commercial product InfoHarness uh, uh, came out in 1995, and uh, the last time I know, uh, uh, I left actually uh, Belcore around that time. Uh, last time I know uh, they were selling is was in 2000, but after that I think it may have morphed into something that is not distinguishable with the original product. So uh, uh, none of those prototypes are operational today, um, except uh, I mentioned uh, you know the product from my company Tali. Uh, you know, it became uh, okay, it became Semagics, and we developed a product called Anti Money Laundering and uh, uh, Know Your Customers. So this is connecting the dots product. So you, uh, given uh, a person who is wanting to, or an institution who wants to open an account, uh, is that person or institution involved in any negative aspects? Uh, you know, uh, after 9/11, U.S. government came up with the Patriot Law, and they required that um, uh, banking institution check that uh, nobody who is involved in, let's say, money laundering, can open an account. So we developed the product from my company. Now that product is already is still in operation. So the product was developed first in 2002. It was deployed at majority of world's largest banks, like Barclays and so on and so forth, and Citibank. And it is still uh, you know, in operation. So commercial products like that may be in operation for a long period of time. Uh, the 1990s example I gave, no, none of them are. In fact, in no area you will find that uh, systems will be working this long. The reason is that there's a Every time there is an operating system upgrade, who is going to you know, get the software working? And why? The people will move on, right? So, but, but they did give you very important value. As I tried to show you, for example, the work we did in our rich media reference shows up in a new incarnation uh, of Google Infobox. So you can, you know, um, today if you are going to be an innovator, you could look at back at the old systems and get inspiration and come up with the innovation that are very important today. Infobox is a very important thing, uh, you know, in the search engine today, and uh, it is very important for Google's own, you know, uh, success of search engine. Uh, today, Google still remains a preeminent search engine because of its use of knowledge graph and because it started knowledge graph before other companies did, and they used knowledge graph. In, they invested more in knowledge graph and they used it more powerfully than being in a Yahoo. So, right, hey, somebody has outlet, uh, USB C, then bring it fast. Okay, go ahead. Other questions? Uh, Adi or Tanacha or anybody else? Uh, uh, a, a, a good question, very good question. Uh, uh, practically every company has now their own knowledge graph. Uh, Microsoft has something called Santori. Um, uh, Facebook has its open um, uh, uh, open social graph. Uh, uh, Google, of course, yeah, uh, and Microsoft, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, let's see who else. So, so LinkedIn has knowledge graph. In fact, if you Google. Uh, LinkedIn common knowledge graph, you will find results. You Google Microsoft common knowledge graph, you will find the results. So every company has a knowledge graph. And in fact, several of my PhD students are employed at companies like um, 
uh, one of my last PhD students got uh, hired by IBM Watson, uh, and her thesis is a knowledge graph. So uh, practically every company now builds knowledge graph. Uh, this thing that I talked about, now everybody understands that um, uh, machine learning and you know uh, deep learning by itself uh, is not good enough uh, for solving all the problems. We really have to uh, to make the solutions more powerful. You have to use uh, knowledge graphs. Sam's you know, and those companies uh, that don't have knowledge graph, uh, say for example Samsung, uh, they have chosen to license the knowledge graph from the companies that do. Anybody else? Uh, if not, I have a question. So, uh, one of my concerns about uh, development and progress in the, in the semantic uh, web field um, has been about the availability of basic tools. Or I should say, uh, the limited availability or lack thereof. Uh, specifically, um, something as simple uh, and obvious, and basic as a, as an editor. Uh, so um, a tool to edit ontologies. Uh, certainly, Stanford's uh, protege project has been around for a long time. Um, there's the uh, expensive uh, editor, top rate composer, but that's prohibitively expensive uh, unless you're paying uh, big bucks as a company. Um, uh, the only really viable, uh, workable uh, owl ontology editor that I've uh, been familiar with. Uh, at an affordable price point that actually provided uh, a quality editor uh, was Semantic Works uh, by the German company Altova. Unfortunately, <laughs> they, they only supported it uh, for a few brief years and then they retired the product and no longer developed it or even offered it for sale. So uh, what are your thoughts about um, when we're going to have affordable alternatives uh, to Stanford's protege um, that provide quality editing tools at an affordable price point. Uh, you, Carl, you had a very good question and um, the, I, I typically associate um, um, lack of uh, significant progress of semantic web to two things. One is the issue that you mentioned, uh, and the other is the fact that there are very few places in the entire world that actually teaches the courses on semantic web. Um, uh, uh, there are, compared to the number of uh, places where you'll have a course on machine learning or NLP, the number of places that you have courses on building knowledge bases on knowledge graph and uh, ontology and using them are far, far, far fewer. That's probably at least an order of magnitude difference. So, and um, I remember I used to work on workflow and I had made a workflow tool available for people to use in academic setting. And that was, that was great, value, great value for people who were teaching those courses. So you are totally right that um, uh, the lack of affordable and quality tools have hindered uh, the progress of this discipline. I, I have my theory, and my theory is that at, at a certain level, uh, the science of semantic web and design of ontology is a, is a science that is not, not as heavily automable as, let's say, the science and engineering of machine learning. And uh, in that um, good ontology design or knowledge graph design, at least at the schema level, requires a human involvement, uh, requires knowledge, you know, involvement of knowledge experts. And what happened was that when um, it came time for companies to 
uh, you know, decide uh, whether to invest in any activity that involves uh, less than a very high level of automation, they shied away. So I remember myself when I had my own company, Tali. I went to uh, Google and I went to uh, Yahoo. This Yahoo was very big then those days. And I said, look, I have this semantic search. And I went to many um, VCs. Of course, I was VC funded, thankfully. But uh, uh, when I went for second round of funding. And these guys will ask questions. So can you, um, uh, uh, can, you know, what does it take to build this knowledge base or, or, or ontology? And I would say, I'll have this kind of process. And I say, I have a high degree of automation. And yet they were, A, not willing to believe, even though we had a uh, very good uh, uh, you know, tooling in that uh, time. I mentioned that I had a very good tooling for our own uh, you know, Tali uh, world model, um, which because it was a commercial company, I could not make it public. But um, because uh, these uh, investors figured out that uh, it could not be convinced that it can be highly automated, they uh, have resisted investing in the tooling. That has happened. And some of us, a uh, few people who know that the tooling can be greatly helpful, and only a little bit of um, um, investment is necessary uh, in terms of human involvement, uh, they didn't have the resources. Then came these other extremes where Google understood that there is an importance of knowledge graph. And they had unlimited money. So they have 1,000 people I mentioned. And they, as far as I know, they are doing still uh, amazing amount of work, extensive amount of work, you, through their use of editors. So they are not, you know, two hundred thousand dollar paid, uh, you know, scientists uh, get pay, getting paid two hundred thousand a year. They are editors that are, you know, not getting, you know, that, that, that are getting paid much less. A majority of those thousand people, but they are relying on editors to do that. When Google has so much revenue and uh, knowledge graph is so important, who is going? Who is asking them? How are you doing it? And how many? How much do you invest in that? So, so, um, and they have uh, no incentive to make their tooling available to the public to whatever level they have done. Um, now we are at a stage that uh, the power of knowledge graph is very, very uh, acutely understood by everybody. And in fact, uh, the question that uh, Shaditya uh, asked, I think probably was around that line. So everybody is working on um, knowledge graph, but everybody uh, is you know, having, uh, I just had two weeks ago, I had a meeting at, um, let me not mention another company, but a company that for which um, knowledge graph is a very important uh, thing. And I met the uh, uh, head of the person responsible for developing knowledge graph for the team. And I was amazed to see how backward they were in developing knowledge graph and the lack of tooling that they had and so on and so forth. So uh, I think that this is a discipline where the lessons have not been learned too well. In our discipline, what also went wrong is that um, uh, I showed you the, you know, that, that there's this, we lost a lot of time, ground in uh, uh, two groups, the description logic and non-description logic groups of the semantic web. And um, the tooling really uh, has not happened um, well at all. And um, I gave you some, you know, um, I, you know, some views on that. It's not, uh, you know, uh, and those are all my in internal, my, my own personal views of it. There's no organized way, uh, no, no organized thought as to why we don't have good tooling. But the observation that we don't have it is quite on the mark. And, um, here is the thing, there's another interesting point I want to make. There is the saying, right, there's no free lunch, and also saying pay now or pay later. So what happens is that unfortunately in the world, everybody is uh, very keen to um, uh, take uh, lower hanging fruits, but not interested in uh, actually sowing the seed for something that will give a lot of uh, good, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot of fruits uh, in a few years down the road with a lot of effort. So what happens is that you know you have these toolkits that you can apply all your machine learning algorithm to this thing and see uh, you know come up with the F score and say oh this one is performing well <laughs> and so we'll use that machine learning algorithm, right? Uh, and, and now that is happening to deep learning also. So what has happened is that um, the tooling in those disciplines 
because it is much more easy to do tooling without much human involvement uh, compared to development of ontologies and application ontologies. And hence, uh, people have not invested in developing quality ontologies and when they invest in developing quality ontologies, they don't want to make it public because it's now in terms of property that is really distinct, you know, uh, distinctive for their business. Uh, and hence, um, people don't share you know, the knowledge bases that easily. Uh, and hence, uh, um, uh, and the cost of developing it is not small. So the initial investment is high, and uh, the uh, uh, profit or, or returns because of that high initial interest is also very high. But people go for the projects which have low initial investment, even if the results are uh, you know mediocre. So quick and dirty is something uh, that people like to do. A very simple example is. Each of you ask the question, would you rather type in one or two words in Google search and see the results and then refine or just think a little bit harder and uh, ask the more optimum set of um, uh, terms in the right order with the right um, you know, um, syntax to get the best results in the first round. Most people will uh, shy, of, you know, will, will be happy to uh, ask some keywords, uh, you know, put in some keywords, get results and spend a lot more time going to results rather than asking just the right query from the beginning itself to get good results and not having to do uh, all that uh, sc scouring of the, um, uh, of the results. So I think that is that human psychology where people don't want to invest adequately up front which has led to the challenges of uh, this discipline. Well, let's uh, hope that uh... <laughs> Uh, either that uh, companies like Altova will resurrect their defunct uh, semantic works. I, I actually thought that was so much of a better editor than Protege. Um, obviously, they didn't make enough profit selling it, so they dumped it. Um, uh, or perhaps a PhD student in computer science will come along and devote his dissertation or her dissertation to. Uh, uh, developing a high quality brand new editor for uh, OWL and RDF and the semantic web. Uh, we can only hope. Uh, <laughs> so let's all uh, thank Professor Chef. 